South Bay in general, ball is life. If you're American, Asian American, anytime anybody like came up to like go for a layup, I'd be like, Ooh, uh, so <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if some of my teammates ever hear this. Like, no bitch, just because you suck. That's why we made fun of your ass. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> When we say modern day Asian American, we mean the full breadth of Asian identities, inclusive of gender and sexuality, immigration, adoption, careers, lifestyles, and cultural and racial backgrounds. Today's guests, Janine and Ryan, we got two on today. They are here to share their experiences being both Asian and Black. Janine Oda is an actress whom you may recognize for her roles in Wong Fu Jiapi, Everything Before Us, or Trafe, an unkosher series. And we also have Ryan Alexander Holmes, who is an actor, content creator, and speaker. If you're on the socials like me, you may have seen his bilingual skits on TikTok or Instagram, or his roles on The Morning Show, Dear White People, and For the People. In this episode, we'll explore their relationships with family, identity, and culture, and their paths to embracing who they are to the fullest. We are so excited to have both of you on here today. Welcome, Ryan and Janine. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> we're so excited to have this conversation. You, we were joking around earlier how like these two are the most prepared in terms of like you have your good mic. Brian has this amazing camera set up. You guys probably see his beautiful face right now on YouTube. Yes. I'm so excited to have this conversation. So let's just kick it off and start from the beginning. Do you guys both mind sharing, like, where did you grow up? And also, what is your racial and cultural background? And let's kick it off with Janine first. So I grew up in Gardena, California, uh, which is predominantly known for being like a Japanese American community. And my racial background is my mom's going to listen to this. So I got to make sure I say it right. (laughs) I am Japanese American, African American, Native American, and white. And she says she claims all her people. So there you go, mom. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Amazing. Vibes. My turn. Uh, yeah. What were you supposed to say? I'm Ryan. <laughs> I'm sorry. So Ryan, where did you grow up? And what is okay. your racial and cultural background? I grew up in San Gabriel Valley. Big shout out to San Gabriel Valley. So that's, you know, I spent most of my time in Monterey Park, San Gabriel, San Marino, South Pasadena. Um, I grew up sort of in the part that was majority uh, white and Asian. Mm. I'm black and Chinese, 100% black, 100% Chinese. Nice. <laughs> and then just curious, so both of you guys seem like you you grew up in a very predominantly, like, I guess, like Asian area. Like, how was your neighborhood, like, or your neighborhood community's attitude, you know, towards being like having a mixed race family? And whoever wants to start could go. Um, I was like, Ryan, you start, go ahead. Okay. Um... <laughs> I I was the only me and my brother were the only black kids in the whole school district. Oh, wow. So uh, also I'm gonna get a little I'm gonna get a little dark. I'm gonna get a little dark here, okay? But I promise it's gonna be mm. I'm gonna bring the humor. That'll be back. the lights. Bring <laughs> the right. humor back. Go for it. Um, the history of my town was that it was a sundown town. So if you know what a sundown town is, it's uh, black people couldn't be out after the sun went down, mm-hmm. and this was not that long ago. Um, and uh, Growing up there, it was very like conservative, old money uh, history, right? Like, mm. but Asians were moving in. So like, it was probably like 60% white, 40% like Taiwanese, Chinese. That's sort of like the the experience that I had there. Definitely mm-hmm. felt like different, otherized, never really felt like I, I truly fit in. I look back and I'm like, I was trying to be accepted by Chinese, the Chinese kids. But what I didn't know is that they were trying to be accepted by the white kids and sort of assimilate into what we all believed was American culture back then. But I still had a great childhood. Like it was still amazing. I still had friends. It was just that cultural sort of aspect that I look back and I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't know who I was. But inside my household, I was 100% black and 100% Chinese like I celebrated all the holidays and and you know we even celebrated Kwanzaa sometimes um and, and I had like uh, that black culture I had that Chinese culture but as soon as I stepped out of my house it was like okay this is like a completely different thing let me code switch I know I can totally you. relate to that I was thinking the same thing that when you're in your household and you see your parents you're like this looks normal this looks great to me and you know you just you feel good about it and 
it wasn't until you, I feel like the first memories I have of it was elementary school. Um, and like I said, it's a predominantly Asian American community in which I grew up in, but there, it was a mix too. There's a Latin community, black community here in Gardena. You know, I had great friends, but there would be comments here and there. And I didn't start getting comments until when, not when people saw my mom, because I think the first thing that people, when they see me is they're like, oh, she's black. Um, it was when people would see my dad drop me off at school and it was, it was mainly like shock, shock and kind of like, I mean, I don't want to like, be like, I don't know what word to put it. It just was like, the look was like, you know, and Mm -hmm. I could just put, I'll say shock. That's like, Mm -hmm. you know, the more nicer term, but you know, and I would just get comments of just like, how did that even happen? Is your dad Mm -hmm. even from Japan? And you know, just being my awkward self, I'd be like, no, he's from Hawaii. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, then that makes sense. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. And it was like, like I said, it, it just didn't make sense to me. Cause when I went home, I was like, what are they even talking about? Because this looks right to me. My mom and my dad together. Mm-hmm. This looks beautiful. I love this. Me and my mm-hmm. sister growing up. So, you know, it was mixed reactions. I think what what I did was, and what some people might do is you kind of hold on to the bad because I got good reactions too. Some people would be like, Oh, that's so cool. That's so unique. I love that. But I think some of the memories that would stick with me throughout, you know, my life would be the negative ones of, you know, people making weird comments and just kind of, and it was mainly towards why was my dad with my mom? You know, it, which, like I said, it didn't make sense to me because I would look at my mom and be like, I don't like, what you mean? Why is why is he with her? Why is she with him? Like my mom's a mm-hmm. ten. Like I don't get it. You know, like because yeah. of this. Like, well, what's the problem yeah. with this? It, yeah. it, make it make sense. But yes. it wasn't all bad. I think just what stuck with me over time was the negative. I so relate to everything you said. Oh, my yeah, God. I love this. It's I used to hide in the back of my grandparents' like car because mm-hmm. it was that I just didn't want people to ask the questions. Yes, you know what I mean. And that's, and that slowly turns into like, okay, now I'm shameful of being like Asian because, you know, they're Asian and they're looking at me weird because they're asking me these questions and they're judging me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And also back then there was no representation for Asian Americans like there is mm-hmm. now. None. You no. Know? Asian. Yeah. No. Like, and I, I, whenever I tell people these stories of being mixed, I always tell them like, you know, I have to, cause some people are like, no, mixed people are totally accepted and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, maybe it was just me back in the, you know, nineties and two thousands. Maybe it was just how it was back then in Gardena. I don't know. Maybe it was just an isolated moment. But when I talk to other Blasians or mixed people in general, some of them are like, some of them say, you know, no, I had a great experience, no problems. Um, I had a friend I recently talked to. She, um, she's half black and Asian, but she grew up in Hawaii. And she's Hmm. like, my, my experience was great. It was very accepted. People thought I was an Islander. I get mistaken for an Islander all the time too, when I go there. Um, And then other people are like, no, you're either, you're not enough of one and you're not enough of another, you know? Mm. At what, at what age or at what point do you feel like you were finally able to accept yourself and and not hide in the back of your grandparents' car and and be like, yeah, this is just who I am. and And I do love it. My family is amazing. Way later in life way later i mean also my grandpa passed away so it's like when i was a teenager so i look back at that and i'm like damn what what did i miss like what did i miss by allowing society to tell me like or to dictate how i act you know Mm -hmm. i think it's only really been in the past like few years honestly Mm -hmm. i started making like the certain content that i make now you know where i'm talking about how proud i am and I didn't even know the impact. I didn't know the impact that it would have on other people. And I didn't also know the impact that it would have on me mm-hmm. because I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't know how like affected I actually was by mm-hmm. all this stuff that happened to me as a child. Right. Mm-hmm. It's almost like you were doing the internal work by working yeah. through it and sharing how you're feeling too. Exactly. Yeah. And then that forms a community too. Like I didn't think that um, other Asians at all would accept me, you know? Mm-hmm because I had like real bad experiences with the Asians I grew up with in terms of like culture and race. Mm-hmm. My my brother got in a huge fight with his best friends over the N word because they wanted to use it. And he was like, mm-hmm. not today, not any day. Mm-hmm. And they got in a huge fight. And I remember my best friend wanted to use it. Like I was at his house. I remember this like vividly. This was like so long ago. And he said, you know, I should be able to say it. 
And I'm like, I don't really want you to. It makes me uncomfortable. He's like, well, I'm Chinese and you're Chinese. So I should be able to mm-hmm. say it, even though, you know, you're, I'm not black, but we're both Chinese. And I'm like, that's not how that works. Yeah. That, and then I left, and then I left his house and I never saw him again. That was it. Oh. We weren't friends anymore. You know? And it's like, mm-hmm. it's so trivial actually, you know what I mean? And it comes from not having sort of this, you know, education about mm-hmm. who we, it's not even just me. It's not even just African-American history. It's Asian-American history. We both don't know who we are because we're not taught our history in school. Mm-hmm. So that mm-hmm. totally sort of dictates how we act towards each other culturally, mm-hmm. even though, you know, we both were Taiwanese Chinese. I don't listen, this is going to happen a lot. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I just need to get this. I just need to say it. Same. This is therapy. And I said <laughs> it. I love it. Wait, I do have a question. Um, like using the N word, is that something that you feel okay doing yourself, or is that something you try to, you know, uh, how do you feel it about comes that? Out. I just, yeah. I just say it. You know, it's I say it when. I mean, obviously, when I'm with my black friends. I mean, sometimes it slips out when I'm not with my black friends, and I have to catch myself. But it, it's turned into, <laughs> it turned into something that's just like a term of endearment. Like mm, it really yeah. is. Yeah. Once you like really start to understand sort of the vitriol of the word and how we reclaimed it mm-hmm. um, and then how we use it in our culture. Mm-hmm. Like I remember me and my brother like practiced how to say it, how to say it. <laughs> we were like in our, in our like rooms. What's that? Like, yeah. Talking back and forth. Like, is that how you say it? It's an A, right? Is that- no, that's too hard of an that's R. Too, that's too hard of an R. But you're not hitting the A. You're not hitting that vowel. Right. <laughs> Reynolds, you got it. You got it. Uh, like you know what I mean. Put some some oomph in. Janine, and this is bringing up memories for you too. <laughs> well, for me, it's it totally does because my mom did not allow it. My mom did not allow it. My aunts didn't allow it. My grandma didn't allow it. So we weren't, you know, we never said it. And it wasn't until my parents had my brothers, and when they started getting older, they say it like, you know. Like, you know, it's just normal. So then mm. I was just kind of like, oh, is that okay? Like, mm. you know, it's fine. And my mom will say it too, but it's funny. Like we, like me and my sister, she was just like, you're not allowed to say that word, okay? That's the white man's word. And I was like, mm-hmm. I said, no, not a hard R. Like, yeah. hey, like, and she was like, no. I was like, okay. So can I we, ask a question? Yeah. Ask a question? When was the first time you were called the N word by someone who wasn't black? Uh, Middle school. Okay. Yeah. middle school yeah my I'm was third grade and it was from a kid from, it was from a kid from South Carolina who like moved to the neighborhood it's so fitting I know oh. I was like where'd they come from how did, how'd you how'd you both yeah. react to that situation oh I I didn't know what it meant at the time I'd never like really heard it but I the mm. way that he said it I was like you're about to see these hands <laughs> my guy and then, but, but, but the teacher, but the teacher like heard that and like dragged his ass away real fast. Wow. That's good. Good. And he almost got expelled. He got suspended. Uh, and my dad had a little private chat with him. Nice. A private, little private chat. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Dang, with a third grader. Oof. I know. That is a lesson. That's an early lesson for him. Uh, he's third talked to me grade. later in life. Like we oh. friends on Facebook. He's talked to me mm. later in life. He's like, dude. Um, yeah, I learned. No, I, learned, I, I don't think kids understand what yeah. they said at that age. I don't think, no. you know, even thinking about like mm-hmm. kids who made comments to me about anything from my mom to my hair, they, like they don't know why they said what they said. Even like, yeah. you know, I was talking to my dad about like, you know, why this, why that? And he was just like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember back then why I did this, why I did that. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think just, you know, I don't want to be like, oh, they're just dumb kids. And I mean, I have no, yeah. I don't think anybody knows why they said that stuff. It's, it's the, I feel like it's the conditioning of like, you mm-hmm. know, what they consume. That's so true. I was going to actually bring up a story. So I was in Taiwan recently with family and my cousin, just Taiwanese, like has, doesn't come to the States. He asked my brother and I was like, hey, why did they, why are they saying this word? And he said it. And he was like, what does it mean? And I was like, how do I explain to someone who's not from America yeah. who's watching entertainment like there's movies american movies at play in taiwan mm. and i was like he and he was like do you say it like do i say it and i was like no you don't first of all your english isn't very good too like it's not like you shouldn't like that's just not a word we you can use but it just yeah. how do you explain this like this thing to someone who who's not from mm-hmm. the states yeah i mean you i the way that i would explain it is with compassion and i'd be like mm-hmm. listen everyone's free to say that word 
Mm-hmm. Everyone's free to say it. There's just consequences if you do say it. Yeah. You know? They might not come from me, but I'm just letting you know. Mm. You say that or you get filmed saying that, you're, there's going to be consequences. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a lesson. It's a lesson for, for people who are just starting to think about it, right? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, when you think back to your childhood, it sounds like you both have some amazing families. <laughs> what are some of your strongest family memories as as young Janine and as young Alex, specifically growing up in a bicultural household? I want to say that because we were talking about it, me and my family the other day, and it definitely became like, you know, such a heated conversation because at first I was like, oh, you know, anything we did culturally, any practices. And that was, I'll get to that in a minute. That was hilarious. So if you grew up in Gardena and you were Asian American, you definitely, you probably were in an athletic club, like an Asian athletic club. So I was in FOR and I played basketball. Um, Our team was called Nezumi, which means rats in Japanese. (laughs) (laughs) We were the year of the rats. So that's why, you know, that, yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah, that that makes sense. Yes. But um, so my dad taking me to that and just getting us all involved in like all these athletic activities, the June and Yosh tennis club, Um, my mom teaching us how to sew. And then, you know, she always had stories connected to like her sewing and her crafts with like family stories, you know, like being black, African-American history. And, you know, it was just at the time I thought it was kind of like, oh, okay, okay. Hurry, hurry, hurry. You want me to learn how to make a t-shirt when I could just buy a t-shirt. But now that I'm older, um, you know, I cherish those memories when I think about them of all these things that she tried to teach me, you know, and both each separately in their own ways. Like my dad with sports was kind of his thing, getting us into that. And then he was very involved, you know, he took us to all the practices He was at all the games. And then my mom was more with, you know, her crafts and, and just teaching us how to do things, you know, with our hands. Um, And then all together as a family, I want to say it was just like our dinners together, our dinners together, no TV talking. And like I said, it just felt right to me. It never felt inside these walls. It never felt weird. It never felt like a question of why or how or anything. It was I don't, you know, it sounds really cheesy, but it was beautiful. It was like, this makes sense to me. You know, you guys look great together. We look great as a family and just like laughing and talking at the dinner table. I mean, when I think about culture of food as a huge part of it, what were like the top three things that were always on the dinner table? Rice for sure. <laughs> yeah. If my dad didn't have rice and I remember my mom went through a phase where she was trying to get us to be healthier. She did brown rice, wild rice um long rice oh my god my dad would have a fit if it wasn't just regular plain white rice so my mom had to get accustomed to that and she had to get accustomed because you know to her it was like rice every day okay because she'd be like well why don't we do like pasta my dad Mm -hmm. has spaghetti and rice on the side which she would like you know joke about Mm -hmm. and stuff like that so she had to get accustomed to that and she just she makes everything I mean she's really good at like chicken, pasta, seafood, soups. Mm. Like she, I mean, she throws down in the kitchen for sure. And then my dad would kind of make like these little types of, I mean, it's not necessarily sushi, but it, he would call it like football sushi. It was like that little tofu wrap mm. with um, some rice in it. And he would put little stuff mixed in it. Natto, which I used to think was disgusting, but now, you know, I like it a little bit more mm. and like seaweed and stuff like that. So like a little mix of like both cultures were on the table at all times, which mm. I love now. That sounds nice. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good blend. How about for you, Ryan? Um, I was a Boy Scout growing up and I remember my grandpa coming to this uh, troop meeting and doing calligraphy for people. Wow. And, and people like kids thought that that was so cool. I was like, oh, shit, this is kind of cool, huh? Being Chinese is pretty cool. Like in my mind for the first time, like really, really sort of diving into that idea of it. Because, you know, growing up, like people would just be like, oh, you're black. You need to act more black. If you had the Mm. audacity, these white kids and Asian kids had the audacity to tell me that I wasn't black enough. Are they more black than you? That's they what say I'm stuff saying. Stuff like that. Yeah. I'm like, where are you getting this from? And we know where they're getting it. I'm like, from. okay, be more black than me then. Cool. Yeah, they, great. They're anyway. getting it from the news. They're getting it from the NBA and the NFL <laughs> and BET, all the acronyms. Um, and so that was the first time where I'm like, oh, yeah, outside of the house, right? Of course. 
where I'm like, oh, other people think this like is cool. Like aspects of this culture are cool. But also like Janine, like we, I would, I would always be over at grandma and grandpa's house with my cousins, you know, one of which is Japanese and Chinese. So mm -hmm. also mixed. And we would celebrate all the holidays and we eat all the food and, you know, we would go to, uh, we would burn paper money for the ancestors. We would, mm -hmm. you know, have Chinese prayers and we would bow and burn incense. We would do all the Chinese stuff all the time. My dad made it a, a thing. He was like, yeah, these kids need to understand, even though the world sees them in a certain way. Because like, look, Black people understand like the way that the world sees us and society sees us is going to affect us if we don't opt out of that and dictate mm -hmm. who we are for ourselves. And I, mm -hmm. I think my dad was really adamant about making sure that we knew. And also growing up in, in, in my neighborhood, I told you the history of it, like the cops knew who we were, but we weren't troublemakers. Mm -hmm. You know, I look back and I'm like, why were, why were the cop like the D.A.R.E. program, that officer, he singled me out all the time, you know, poked fun at me and stuff. And I was always like, because I, I didn't have a concept of race. So I was just like, there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I don't know what it is. And I maybe I need to like be nicer or kinder or go out of my way. And it just didn't work. But looking back, I'm like, oh, he was just he was a racist cop. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So. I'm really happy with the way that I was raised because I can look back and not even in a devastating way, like, oh yeah, that was racism. Not in a way where I'm like, that was racism and I, they did me wrong. I'm like, no, I'm stronger because of it, mm -hmm. you know? There were so many moments in my childhood, like in hindsight that I look back where I'm like, oh, those were like big, powerful, cultural moments in mm -hmm. my life that were actually turning points in my life. I just didn't realize that they were because my parents didn't want me to sort of think about my childhood in that way as I'm a child, mm -hmm. you know? They want me to like enjoy my childhood. And I do get pretty emotional sometimes when I'm thinking back at moments where I'm like, oh wow, they were doing all that behind the scenes, you know? They were like pulling the strings, making sure I was okay, talking to the mm -hmm. principal, talking to these teachers. They tried to put me in special ed. They tried to put my brother on Ritalin and also in special ed too. And my dad had to be like, I will, I will burn the school district down if you mm. don't leave my kids alone. My mm -hmm. kids are smart. They're brilliant. They're going to do big things in life and you need to leave them alone and, and treat them like the, their kids, treat them like mm -hmm. their kids mm -hmm. and they're allowed to make mistakes. And I, I look back and I'm just like, we really got everything that we needed out of out of the resources in that community mm -hmm. and then we moved to the to a different community you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but I'm so happy that my parents understood that I'm black and I'm Asian and mm -hmm. I'm in this environment and it's going to take more concern and care to properly raise these kids in America Mm. Yeah, yeah. Was there any part of growing up, it sounds like your parents were sort of doing a lot behind the scenes to make sure that the school was teaching you or treating you well and making sure that you were just like a normal kid. Was there anything that they were doing or or saying to you to say like, beware of this or, you know, you are different. This is how this is how you have to like operate in this world to survive. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, listen, police brutality and let's just get into it like my my dad had to have that talk with me because my yeah. parent, my brothers were arrested in our, on our main street by like six officers because they were skateboarding at the school at our school that was like mm -hmm. right next to our house and I remember seeing that as like a six-year-old and my brother's crying handcuffed to both of my brothers handcuffed on the sidewalk mm -hmm. in front of our school in front of the whole main street everyone can see it right and and then them coming home and telling me what happened and it's like you know, in San Francisco, you know, when the cops come, we just scurry off. But then they started chasing us and then they called for backup and then they pulled guns on us. Mm -hmm. And then we didn't know what to do because we're like, we got to We have to get it well, they're pulling guns on us. Like, what are we supposed to do? You know, so they're like 10 and 12 at that time, maybe younger. And so I remember hearing that and seeing how my dad had to respond to that. And I was like, oh, like, it's not safe, even in this safe neighborhood that we live in like I can't do certain things 
mm-hmm. you know? And my dad was able to explain that in a way to us where we could still be rambunctious ass kids, you know what I mean? And not be afraid. But had he not had that talk with us, we would have been, we would have been terrified for the rest mm-hmm. of our childhood. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it, we have to have those conversations with our kids. And I think it's ironic because we're in the, one of the safest neighborhoods in all of like the nation, right? Mm-hmm. But safe for who? Mm-hmm. You know, because the people that are supposed to keep us safe are the people that we're most unsafe afraid from. Of. Yeah. And and afraid of, right? But my my dad had to put that, frame that in a certain lens to make it, us feel safe and made us understand that like, you know, there are some the world's not black and white, right? Even in the even with the cops, like this, this did happen with you, but I don't want you to see all cops as this, mm-hmm. right? There's a certain way that you probably need to carry yourself around police officers because they have a history, but mm-hmm. don't see all police officers the same way. Don't let this paint your vision of the world mm-hmm. and keep being kids. Mm-hmm. Janine, same question for you. Like, did your parents try to sort of, I guess, protect you in a way or try to help you navigate the world as someone who is mixed race? I want to say that my dad was definitely like that. He was kind of like, you're good. Bye. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But like, they didn't really do anything behind the scenes. It was more if I said something, you know, if I brought something up of like, oh, you know, um, I got made fun of for my hair. I want to start training my hair. And then my mom would have more talks about me about beauty which I, you know, at the time I thought like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I want my hair chemically straightened, you know, especially in the late nineties, like I said, is that's when I started to get more comments, I would say about my looks, um, when I was in middle school and in the late nineties, I feel like you didn't really see natural hair for in the black community as much. Maybe it it was more straightened. And I feel like that was just the style, like everybody straightened their hair. So you know, my mom had more talks with me about like, I love your hair. You need to love your hair the way it is. Um, when I approached my dad about being bullied and I didn't necessarily tell him like all the details and I don't even think he cared. He just heard I got bullied or like, they're making fun of me. Um, you know, I was crying and he just was like, he didn't really go off on anybody. He just was like, well, then we're, we're done with them. We're done with them. You know, I'm going to tell them you're not coming to this uh, basketball team anymore. If you don't want to do it, it's totally fine, which, Mm. you know, was nice to see it, you know, that they like step up in the way that they did. Mm -hmm. Um, Because my mom really took her time about like taking care of yourself as far as like natural ways. She was very much against me straightening my hair. I mean, she straightened her hair and she was, you know, used to doing the, the chemical straighteners. And she's like, I don't want you to get you know, addicted to it. Cause then, you know, once you start it, you kind of can't stop it or, you know, it takes a minute for it to get back to its normal, its normal state. So she ne- never wanted me to do that. So she would take her time with teaching me how to take care of my hair better, you know, love my skin. Um, I used to think I didn't look half Asian. So when I got comments of like, Oh, you know, you have chinky eyes in middle school, she would be like, Oh, I think, I think it's one of your best features. Who, who said that? And it was just so funny because my mom would scare me because she would pop up to pick me up at middle school when I usually walked home by myself. And she'd be like, so who was it? Who, where? Her? Her? With that much hair? Oh, no. Let me go talk to her. And I'd be like, no, 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 mom, please. <laughs> so, you know, they would show up for me in ways like that. They would stand up for me. My dad is like, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't say many words. He's more of an action type of guy. Yeah. Um, so it, I wasn't sure how he was going to react when I told him, um, when I was playing basketball and I was on a team, I felt like, you know, I was getting picked on for certain things. Like sometimes I felt like I was being picked on because I was, you know, mixed with black or maybe just because I was just this weird kid. What's funny is I think, (laughs) I think they thought because I'm half black, like I said, we're playing basketball. Right. And and so, and like Gardena and Torrance or South Bay in general, ball is life. If you're American, Asian American, mm. you know, yeah, I jumped onto the scene in middle school and I was kind of like, okay, cool. Let's play basketball. I don't care. This looks like fun playing with a <laughs> bunch of kids. And I think they thought when they saw me like, oh, she's half black. Yeah. We'll get her. She's going to be good. Blah, blah, blah. No, I, I had two left feet. <laughs> My braids were always hit me in the face when I was running. <laughs> I was oh tired. My God. I was the worst. Oh my God. And I was the tall one. Oh. So I was a forward. But anytime anybody like 
came up to like go for a layup, I'd be like, Ooh, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was a worse. So I feel like, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some of my teammates ever hear this. Like, no, bitch, just because you suck. That's why we made fun of your ass. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> because, shit, uh, because he was black. And that's what we thought the advantage was. But come to find out it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> But um, I'll never forget, they even put me against this other girl. I forgot her name. It was like something. But she was also half Black, half Asian. And she got like the juggernaut jeans because I was like tiny next to her. And I was like, you want me to defend against her? And they're like, yeah, y'all the same. Like y'all both Black and Asian. And I'm like, okay. Like, and when she, like I said, when she came up with her layup, I remember my dad was so disappointed. I could see his face in his dance. She didn't even touch me and I just fell back. <laughs> that is the cutest visual. I'm like, yeah, envisioning small Janine, just like, yeah, ah. it was we, we had one parent who took videos, you know, with like the cam and everything and everything. Oh, post them on the internet, post yeah. them on the, on, the, on, the, on the socials. I, I, I yeah, I got to do that. I got to take the VHS and then. Yes. <laughs> Yes. But it's funny because you just see little Janine with these big chunky braids because my mom was all about doing a, you know, she'd do like a different braid every game and she thought she was doing some hot shit on my hair, which you know, now looking back, I was like, okay, mom, you had the little baby hairs curled out. She had like new barrettes and everything, but you already know. And then Asian American league, they were like, oh, what you, is that? Oh, okay. That's it. Okay, girl. Ooh, okay. But <laughs> It was, you just see like chunky braids running around, me dribbling, and then I lost the ball. And yeah, unfortunately I didn't get those NBA jeans. My mom tried, my mom even tried to teach me better basketball skills. Cause she was like, okay, you, like you're not doing me any, and, you know, people looking at me <laughs> thinking like, why you ain't, you know, ball is life, remember? And I'm like, okay. But when I told my dad, you know, I was like, those girls are mean to me. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's just all he needed to hear. And he was yeah. like, all right, you're out. You're out. Don't worry. We don't have to do it anymore. Later on, I told him why. And he said he kind of knew. He said he could mm. kind of see it. You know, like I said, he was there all the time. He dropped me off at practices, picked me up. I think he could tell I was kind of isolated from the group. Yeah. You know, if everybody was getting picked up, I was kind of like on the side or I would like try to make friends and be like, hey, you know, it's I'm also sure as a parent, you can tell. Yeah. And it's, I, I'm happy to hear that it sounds like both your set of parents are just super supportive. And like, I feel like we kind of just took us back into these experiences. So thank you so much for sharing. I do want to dive deeper into like identity and like, I know you guys already share some of this already, but do you have any, like, what are some experiences or other challenges unique to being mixed race that others may not be aware of? I feel like it's. <laughs> Ryan's like, mm. uh, I'll just say, I feel like it's the, you know, I think the challenge for me at, at least was you never feel or for me growing up now I feel better about it. Thanks to Ryan too. I feel like your content empowers me. And I've been telling people a lot lately before I even found out we were doing this podcast. And even when they first asked me, I was like, Oh, what, why me? No, I'm not qualified for this. Oh, cause I'm Blasian, I guess. And I was praying and hoping I was like, I hope another Blasian can do it with me. Mm. You know, I didn't feel I don't know. I, I it, it sounds crazy now because I was like, I didn't feel Blasian enough to even wow. speak on this. You know, just so now, speak on so now it. That's a thing. I, wow. <laughs> didn't yeah. think it could be. Yeah. Uh, I feel better now, obviously, about it. But I was like, oh, it'd be so cool if they could get somebody like, you know, like Ryan Alexander Holmes, but he's probably busy, busy, you know. Um, but looking at your content, I would tell everybody raving about it, like, yes, 100% black, 100% Asian. Um, cause I felt like, you know, as I got more older and mature, that's how I felt like, I don't have to prove anything to anybody. Cause growing up, you never feel enough of one or the other, mm -hmm. you know, you always feel like, you yeah. know, and then trying to fit in with each, Yes. you know, it, yes. it's just such a struggle. Like, you yes. know, I want to fit in with the, the black girls and I, or I want to fit in with the Asian girls or, yeah. and you just never feel enough. You always feel like you're the out of place one. It's, it's interesting because. I feel like I've come so far in just embracing what it means for me in a public forum, right? And it also came from, damn, I'm sorry I go so dark, but it it came from like trauma, like it, yeah. like deep seated trauma and not having a voice mm -hmm. and not feeling like anyone would care. And then being like, nah, fuck that. I'm gonna say exactly how I feel in this moment and I do not care how anyone else responds to it. 
Mm-hmm. And like the first viral post that I had was on subtle Asian traits during like BLM and stop Asian. It was right after George Floyd and like mm-hmm. how we all marched together. I marched with my Asian community for BLM and then stop Asian hate happened. And I'm like, oh yeah, we got to protect our elders. But then I saw so many racist comments from the same people who had like marched with me against, mm. against black people. And I was like, what happened? Do you know what I mean? Like, how did you go mm. from marching to saying like, black people are monkeys? Like, how did that, how does that happen? Mm. So like, I had to address it. Mm. And I had to address it as, you know, as a member of the Asian community, which I felt like I was not allowed to do. Mm. And I remember having a conversation with my brother and he was like, you got to just speak as if you're an Asian man because you are, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. you can talk to me all day. I have kids. I can't really listen to you talk all day about this, but I want you to like share it to the world. Like you don't, if we're just having this conversation amongst brothers, it's like, think about how powerful the message could be. And I was like, I don't know, man. I might get canceled because they're canceling people out here, man. Let like, them cancel you. That's what I'm saying. So like I posted that and I really honestly thought that no one would support it and people would say I was racist and people would sort of say like, just just sort of double down on what I thought like in my head, like I'm not allowed to speak as an Asian man. Mm-hmm. But it was like mm-hmm. the complete opposite. You know, it was yeah. like 95% support and then like 5% people, you know, saying like, shut up, you're not Asian. So I was like, wait, so there's all these people that support this message when, you know, I'm still, I'm still living off of the trauma as a, of a kid of not being accepted. Right. And so I realized that I had brought the past trauma with me into the present and I was allowing it to dictate my actions. Right. Mm-hmm. And dictate how I feel about my own community. When like the community has com- has changed a lot, there's been a lot of education. There's been a lot of growth in terms of cultural understanding and cultural impact between, you know, and cultural education about the black community, and the and the media can sort of distort that. What's really mm-hmm. going on, right? They can blow mm-hmm. things out of proportion, and when they do, they can influence other people to think that way. So like, I was like, how can I just com- continue to embrace this and show people like, look, there's a completely other different side to this that they're not showing you, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. in the media, they're not showing you in movies and and and, and, and in TV, you mm-hmm. know? And another thing that Janine was saying too, is just like not feeling enough. What does that really mean? Because I had to really dive into that. And really it's just outside forces telling you that. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with who you are and how you embrace your culture. And also, I had to find like the humor in it. And for me, it was like calling out the hypocrisy and the irony of someone else telling you like, you can't act that way. And it's like, who the fuck are you? You're mm-hmm. not me. You didn't, you don't have the experiences that I have. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. And like, it's funny when you lay it out like that. It's just funny. Because why are you telling me how I need to act? Are you God? Mm-hmm. Are you like the the gatekeeper of Asian culture mm-hmm. or Chinese culture? Mm-hmm. Like who appointed you? Because you're really bad at your job. You need to be fired <laughs> and they need to hire someone who's qualified because what you're saying is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that during um, a time where it was very tumultuous for both of your both sides, you know, your Asian and your black side, you decided to instead of sort of feeding into the narratives that were going on, you were like, let me control this narrative in this chaos. Let me try and control this and say say my truth because this side is not being shared enough. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you brought yeah. a lot of peace to people out there by by just sharing authentically what you were feeling, what you were thinking. I also just want to say this. It, it was very hard. Press mm-hmm. that post button. Like mm-hmm. I was having, pan- I was literally having panic attacks. Mm. Because I was like, I've never done this before. I'm putting myself out there. I don't know how people are going to react. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it really made me, in hindsight, understand how much I cared about what other people think mm-hmm. and how dangerous that can be. Yeah. And also how important it was for you to press that. I feel like usually when you're so fearful of something, it means that you care about it a lot and you're really passionate about it. And it means a lot to you and it can really impact people. I'm glad you pressed publish. I'm glad you pressed post and I'm glad the content is out there. Me too. As we approach summertime, I'm looking forward to trading in my warmer clothes for cooler fits. 
Last season, I was able to get a great staple charcoal gray trouser along with other items through Stitch Fix. I've been liking their freestyle option where you can select and shop pieces on your own. Or if you'd like some style assistance, they can pair you with a stylist who will learn about your tastes and collaborate with you on looks, which is how I found one of my favorite pair of vegan black boots a couple of years ago. They have over a thousand brands and styles to choose from and a wide range of sizes for all body types from extra small to 3XL. With Stitch Fix, there's no subscription required. Simply order a refresh as needed or set it and forget it with regular seasonal fixes. Shipping returns and exchanges are always free. Right now, Stitch Fix is offering ABG listeners $20 off their first fix at stitchfix.com slash ABG. That's stitchfix.com slash ABG for $20 off today. Stitchfix.com slash ABG. Um, Well, I think it's no surprise that there is a lot of racism and bigotry that exists in our shared community. And I'm curious in what ways, um, maybe especially during those those times, these past few years, have or haven't you found support within the Asian American community at large? (laughs) You go first. (laughs) Um, No, it's been it's been insane, actually. It's been something that I never thought Mm -hmm. was possible, honestly, because. You know, I didn't experience it as a kid in, in the way that I'm experiencing it now. Like, it's it's kind of crazy. It's kind of like a dream. I didn't think that people in the community would uplift me or care what I had to say or invite me on a podcast to talk about my experiences. Like, I didn't think that would ever happen. I was talking about to my friend the other day. And I was just like, yeah, like, if you don't do the thing that 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 you're passionate about, that it also, like, is the most unique thing about you, nothing is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Nothing is going to happen for you in that way because you're not putting, you're literally not putting it out there, right? For people to reject it or accept it, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, what if I just had that conversation with my brother and I'm like, yeah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm just going to keep this to myself. You know, mm-hmm. it would it would have changed the, it would completely change the course of my life. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'd still hold shame and guilt um, from the past trauma, and I'd still think about the Asian community at large as something that like didn't fuck with me, and you know looked at like they all saw me as just the black guy, and they didn't mm-hmm. accept me and would never accept me. So there is something. Mm-hmm. It's not just self liberation; it's also liberating other people's minds. And all you have to do is like uh, show yourself unencumbered, right? Not it's easier said than done. But it blows my mind that like you just have to live in the joy of who you are mm-hmm. to to like change other people. Because my my goal is not to change other people. My my goal is to show the joy that I live in every day, mm-hmm. and 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 to embrace who I am every day, and then share that. Right? I'm not out here like I'm gonna change your mind, racist. You know, I'm not because that's like a losing game, and and it's also kind of egotistical. You know. But if you just focus on what you love and who you love and 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 what you love about yourself and share that unencumbered, like it's such a yeah. different pathway, you know? Mm-hmm. And I feel like when you are doing that, you do get the support from the community too. Yeah. They they start to understand and they can start to be compassionate and empathize and be like, yeah, yeah. that is your your experience that maybe I'm not used to because I didn't grow up that way. But I yeah, yeah I accept you and I love you for who you are and what you've been through Mm -hmm. yeah it's and i i want to know also how janine feels about this but like i can walk into circles now and feel like everything is good like i don't need to act a certain way yeah like if someone makes fun of me i'm just like okay oh i can give a shit less of anybody yeah (laughs) that's your problem dude like that has nothing to do with me yeah like you're in a prison of how you think i should act because of such and such but i'm not in that prison with you buddy I yeah. wish someone would make fun of me now. I'm too old for that <laughs> shit. I wish they would. <laughs> when I think about like how I was younger, I, I think I I didn't feel, you know, the support from the Asian American community when I was younger up until like college. And then when I got older, um, definitely from like, I have an amazing support group of friends, family. I felt like, you know, there were no more weird, awkward questions or anything like that. There was no more like, you know, anything 
no, like everybody was embracing like, oh, I love your hair like that. Yes. Wear it down, wear it out natural, you know, because that was one of my main concerns. Wait, I'm sorry, Ryan. I totally forgot your question. What did you say? My mind blinked out. Oh, no, I was just saying like <laughs> how you feel about like just because when I would be around all black people, like, oh, I need to act. Black. Oh, like, yes, yes, yes. Around Asian people, I need to act Chinese and only talk about Chinese things, you know? Yeah. You know, it's funny. So my brother, when I was telling them like, um, you know, my whole family about like all these, these topics that we're going to talk about, and my brother had a really great point. He said that we're, we're chameleons, you know, mixed people are chameleons and he feels like in any situation, you know, we can kind of be a different version of ourselves, um, you know, depending on like what group we're in. And I, I really feel that I feel that I can easily adapt or I, I kind of think I'm kind of the same person with everybody, but I feel like maybe my appearance or maybe just my personality, I feel that yeah. is easily accepted by any group of people. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I have a lot of Latin American coworkers and mm -hmm. I feel very at home with them. I feel like they were my first BFFs when I was a kid too, <laughs> who did not care about what race I was. They're just like, cool, you want to play? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I feel like it's cultural capital. We have cultural capital. Yeah. And we also know yes. how to interact with different groups because that's in our family. So mm -hmm. it's like, regardless, Absolutely. If, regardless if it's like, you know, a his Hispanic culture, like you said, like mm -hmm. it's, it, we view it as like, Hey, I, I respectfully want to know more as opposed to like coming from a sense of entitlement or something like that. Because yeah. We're already double minorities. We see what it's like. Mm -hmm. So if we see another minority or another culture, we're like, Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Like I'd like to know what that's like, as opposed to like, Oh, your food stinks. Yeah. Like, I'm I feel like we already come from a background of like, you know, maybe asking a little bit, like, oh, that's, well, how do you guys do this? And oh, that's so yeah. cool. And not like, well, yeah. why? That's yeah. weird. Yeah, that energy is just so stank. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, get it away from me. I feel like I'm learning so much <laughs> of us hearing you guys just both share your stories. And I feel like <laughs> for us, this podcast and this episode really is just um, for us to also learn about through mm -hmm. your experiences, like what you both go through. And, you know, for our listeners out there who are, who are also learning alongside us, is if you could eliminate like certain like terms, comments, stereotypes, or like, you know, you could probably, you guys both probably get really awkward questions. Hmm. What would they, what would, what would, I guess, what are two things you would eliminate? Uh, one thing that I feel like, you know, I would hear a lot, especially in my adult life is uh, that is kind of like cringe to me is when people say like, oh, that's your Asian side. Oh, that's your black side. Mm. And like, you know, we can all take a guess. Everything positive is my Asian side. And if I get loud or crazy or, you know, aggressive or, you know, if I, you know, bust a crazy move on the dance, I'm like, oh, that's Janine's black side. I'm like, okay. I mean, yeah, that is my black side, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Well, my dad can get crazy too. <laughs> because if it's not positive, it's racist. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes when it is positive, it's racist. Too. Yeah. And my dad said the same thing. My dad was like, hey, it ain't all that cracked up to be Asian. All right. People got you all yeah. figured out. Yeah. They think that you're just going to get straight yeah. A's. You're going to get the best yeah. job, blah, blah, blah. And it's not yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Very so. high, un unnaturally high expectations in, in a very like narrow view. Yeah. Very, very narrow scope. Yeah. To, to answer your question, um, I would say... I wouldn't change a damn thing. Like, I love when people show their show the, their whole selves by asking. Mm -hmm. I mean, some some people when they ask the question, like it's actually like the intention is actually not racist for sure. Mm -hmm. But when some people say certain things or call me out on certain things, like I've learned to like really actually thank those people and have gratitude for those people because they make me question why I'm doing it and the mm -hmm. impact that I'm having, and also. I have to also learn from what they're saying. They show me that there's people out there in the world, right? Mm -hmm. It helps me understand like the the work that I'm doing mm -hmm. and, and the society that I'm saying this to, that there's people out there that think that way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's funny. Some, <laughs> the other day someone said like, mixed people are the spawn of Satan, repent. And I didn't know if they were serious or if they were joking, but that shit was so funny to me. I know. I kind of wanted to <laughs> laugh. Like, that's, ins <laughs> that's insane. I feel like eventually we'll all be mixed. We're all going to be Pangean again. And I mean, that's yeah. a million years from now, but <laughs> Look, you know. It's it's crazy because at the end of the day, none of this shit actually matters. Like For we sure. use it as these categories. We use categorizations and 
and the skin color and all this shit to differentiate ourselves or make us feel better than the other person, but it's all not even real. Are people born out the womb saying, I hate Mm N-words? Are people born out the womb like dunking basketballs? (laughs) Where do (laughs) these things come from? Because it's not even real, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's all, that's why I can say the things that I say with humor, because at the end of the day, I know that what ties us all together is our humanity and our love for each other, Mm -hmm. like love in general, right? Mm -hmm. So even the people that are screaming, and this this is something that I learned from, Van Jones, who was, you know, uh, you know, on the personal team to Obama, and he told me the story, he said, you know, when I was working in the White House, we get all these letters, like hate mail, like the most racist hate mail you could ever receive, like, in your imagination. And Obama was like, we can't show this to the public. I don't want anyone to know about this. I don't want it to be a story. Because I want to help. I still want to help these people. And I don't Mm -hmm. want to cause more division. And I know these Mm -hmm. people aren't saying that from their actual heart. They're saying it from the conditioning, from from their surroundings and what people are saying about me to them or what they think they think about Black people, Mm -hmm. you know? But they don't know that I'm actually helping them, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to cause more derision by saying like, even though I get this or make it about me, even though I get this hate mail, I'm still helping you because it's not about that either. Yeah, Just about helping people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the core, I feel like, of where you're operating from and you see everyone as human, you're going to be you're going to be all right. And you're going to be able to interact with humanity and just the world in a different way. It's going to be more of you'll be more empathetic, more compassionate to even people that hate you because you'll know that they're not they don't really hate you. Mm -hmm. They hate they hate their own projection of you. And that's Mm. that's them. And then I can have compassion for that. I'm like. The hate you have for me is the hate you have for yourself, mm-hmm. you know, and not in an egotistical way. It's just that you've been raised in your in in your environment to think these things, but really it's your insecurity and you don't know that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's I can have compassion for. And I do not hate you. I'm not going to reciprocate the hate that you give me. I'm not mm. because then that just makes me a hateful person, too. Right. If you yeah. dead that shit, if you dead that shit, if you put up a, a wall there, it doesn't continue to proliferate. And we see what it happens when you when that shit proliferates in America, right? I don't want to mm-hmm. contribute to, contribute to that. I don't think anyone else wants to either if they're conscious about that. Yeah. Dang, that was really powerful, right? Yeah, <laughs> that was. Like, I forgot like, where let me I take was a for second. a second. <laughs> I know. Let me take a second. <laughs> um, no, that was so second. well said. Um, but it reminded me. Um, that, you know, when, like I said, when me and my family were all talking about it, it, it reminded me to have, my mom was kind of saying this, have more grace with people, mm. you know, look at things with things with kinder eyes, you know, things yeah. from the past, forgive, forget. And even things now, you know, like you were saying, you know, I love that you said, like, I wouldn't change a damn thing. Cause it kind of shows me where the person is. And then you took the, the, the route of love, you know, mm-hmm. not the route of like, now I'm going to be mad at you and I'm going to hate you. Cause for what? Who are they? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And what's yeah. that going to do for you at the end of the day? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of love, I'm, I'm curious because like you guys kind of shared about your family background and stuff. And I, I don't know, if, uh, you know, I, I feel like this, I don't want to talk about stereotypes, but like, I think, you know, being Asian, or Asian American, there's like the stereotype, like, you know, your Asian family, they don't really express love or they're very more passive with saying, I love you or do or like they, they say, you know, they give you fruit. That's like the way of saying, I love you. For you know, as both of you guys, how is love expressed on one side of the family versus the other, or is it the same? <laughs> Ryan, your face, I can't. Definitely not the same. But no, definitely not. Janine, same. you, I want you. you go. Well, I was gonna say I love Ryan's videos of his grandmother, and I just love mm-hmm. seeing your guys' relationship. I love seeing your relationship with your parents, because um, I can definitely relate to it. You know. My mom is very, she's always been very hands-on, very loving. It's a big deal for her to say, you know, these words, like she's very on my dad about saying things like, say, good job. You did a good job. Say you love them. Um, because, you know, and I could totally relate to the Asian American side. My dad, you know, he's a man of few words. He's not really good at expressing stuff like that, but he'll do it in action. Um, which is like, you know, he takes care of us, um, you know, whether it be financially, he'll get us something that we need. Um, I remember even if my parents gotten in like a tiff or something, he is like, he couldn't 
he couldn't say sorry or he couldn't like, mm. like you know apologize or admit he was wrong but he would be like Janine go get your mom tell her tell her you want to talk to her but then like he'll like be in the room and be like oh hey yeah I made dinner you know like he he's just like that but my mom is very loving you know very like hugs uh words like she always likes to say you know positive things to us and build us up that's a very big deal to her and then my dad is more, you know, I can def- like definitely relate. My dad's more of an actions. Mm-hmm. And um, as far as grandparents go, that's why, you know, every time I see your grandmother, my, unfortunately, you know, my, my dad's side of the family, not side of the family, I shouldn't say, because some of them might listen to this and be like, Hey, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were all accepting um, except my grandmother. So my grandmother, mm-hmm. you know, she had a hard time with it. And when I learned about that as a child, you know, it, it definitely created this like inner conflict in me Mm. because I I love my grandma. I still love my grandma, you know, no matter what, Mm. but to find out that she didn't love my mom just because of this, Mm. you know, really broke my heart. And like, Mm. you know, finding out she didn't come to the wedding, the wedding was almost off and everything. Mm. Um, so, you know, hearing that just created this battle inside of me about both sides. Like, do I need to be mad at my Asian side now? Mm-hmm. Should I look at the, all of them differently? Were, were they all against, you know, this marriage or this union? And mm-hmm. how I said earlier, it's like, if I were to ask her, she passed away when I was in high school, but if I were to ask her, you know, why, uh, you know, I'm sure I don't even think I could ask her, but I don't even know if she really would have an answer. I don't know if she really would have like a real definition of why she wasn't okay with it, why anybody wasn't okay with it. You know, when my mom and me were talking about it, she was like, oh, you know, who knows? Like maybe she thought I was, a, you know, she just painted me as like some druggie or something. I don't know what she thought I was. Like maybe she stereotyped me. Maybe she thought economic status would come mm-hmm. down for them. Um, I think all it came down to is fear is, is mm-hmm. what I kind of come to in my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, I look at, I look at it now with more grace, more kindness. I love my grandma to death. I still love her even, you know, in knowing that, like I said, forgiveness and, you know, I hold nothing against her, but I love seeing Ryan's videos of his grandmother and just that relationship that you guys have is so beautiful to me. It takes time. It takes, yeah. cause I, everything you said, like I could, say hey that's my family too mm-hmm. same thing mm-hmm. like oh, i really yeah yeah my parent my family both sides of it why am i laughing both <laughs> sides of my family didn't come to my parents wedding they didn't no a, they a, i didn't oh had, my god whatever a reception but what's funny is like when you look at the pictures like the, the friends at the time were like asian and black so yeah. like the people you see in those pictures aren't family mm. you know there's still some family there but it's asian and black people so I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, okay. And this is like, you know, the 90s mm-hmm. or, or the, like the late 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what was the question though? I want to make sure that I- <laughs> Oh, my question is, is love expressed Hot differently? Bitch. Is love expressed oh, yeah. differently oh, yeah, in one family question. versus the okay. other? Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. When you said that was a stereotype, it's like, hey, some stereotypes are a little bit accurate. Let's yeah. be real. Uh, because, you know, <laughs> my, my uncle, I don't know if he's going to listen to this, but he initiated a hug the other day. I was like, that's a big step. That's yeah. a big step. Cause usually we, we just do one of these, you know, he's like, Hey, hug, hug. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is like, I don't remember the last time I <laughs> hugged you. I don't, maybe when I was like five years old, but it's just, that's just not how they show love. And to mm-hmm. me, to me though, I have to like, really push back on what I was seeing like these past few years of like, well, my Asian parents don't say, they don't do it in this way. They don't say their love in this way. And I'm like, why are you comparing it to this like Western mm. way mm. of showing love? Mm. And mm. you're saying your parents don't love you because they don't express it in the Western way? Mm. Nah, nah, man. My, my Asian family is about that action. All right. Mm. Like if I ever need them for anything, they are there. And I will, I will always know that mm-hmm. always. Right. So it's like, that's love on that side of the family. Right. And, and, and they have adapted to sort of, I wouldn't even, I don't know if it's the other side. It's just, you know, how my dad expresses mm. love. A lot of kisses, too many, 
a lot of hugs. He still kisses me, man. I'm just like, come on, man. I, you know, but it's that's love and that yeah. hugs and and that actually affects me. It makes me, you know, proud and happy and I feel loved, right? And on my other, my mom's side, like they've started to do that as we've gotten older. Mm -hmm. You know, my uncle is a little late. You know, <laughs> to start doing hugs. But my grandma is like saying, "I love you." Aww. you know in chinese and and in mm. english hugging me giving me hugs kissing me i'm just like man this is dope like like these things sort of have translated and sort of melded uh organically not by mm. force it's not like mm. you need to we're a black and asian family and you need to learn how to do it. no it's just they just organically happen mm -hmm. when you spend that much time together and you know, I think that's also like an allegory for the world. It's just like, mm. you spend enough time with other people and you don't talk about like politics, which like in a lot of ways isn't even real. And we're not talking about things that actually affect our lives, you know? And and also they're spun in a way that makes it, you know, uh, that brings about animosity and hate towards another that you didn't even know existed before they started spinning that story, mm -hmm. right? It, it shows, and I think, you know, just show... First of all, me showing my family, I didn't think anyone would care to. I'm just like showing my family. But I realized sort of the deconditioning that happens when people see it. Mm. But to me, I'm like, this is an average day in my, you know, yeah. with my family. But people are like, I, and someone asked me like, how do you guys do it? How do you guys, <laughs> how do you guys like get along? And I'm like, what do you mean? We're family, like we just love you. Yeah, but you're, you're black and Asian. I'm like, so, what, so are we supposed to just like start fighting because our skin color is different and mm. one's versus black and one versus Asian? We're yeah. just out the womb or fighting. No. And it just shows how deep the conditioning is because they're asking mm. that question in that way. Mm -hmm. It's like, damn, like these motherfuckers are really lost. Like they really think that just because we're black and just because we're Asian mm -hmm. that we can't get along, mm -hmm. right? So the So the work for me is like, kind of easy in a sense where it's just like okay I'll just keep showing the fact that we love each other to the world it's just funny that that can create mm. change and it's mm -hmm. funny and ironic that's that's all you have to do because there's a whole system that has been created that perpetuates the idea that we should not get along right mm -hmm. and you see I see it in the comment section yeah you know what I mean of, of certain Asian media outlets that I'm not going to name. I'll talk to them <laughs> privately. <laughs> Clean up your comments. Um, but I know too that like they they probably don't even know. Mm -hmm. You know, they're playing the game. They're playing the sensational, sensational game where mm -hmm. it's like, just put this news out there. Look, the comments are going to be the comments, but that's not on us. That's just, but it is on you. So, mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. on you. I feel yeah. like Black and Asian, the like the communities, it's like they're different, but they're so similar in so yeah. many ways. And Very. I feel like if they just let go of, you know, worried about their differences or skin color or anything, the vibe is so high. Like when yeah. I see my parents, like when you were saying, like when people are so, you know, they see these videos of your parents, I wish I could video my parents like you do. The minute I even pull up a camera now, they're like, what are you doing? No, don't try don't to exploit listen. me. Listen, it was like that in the beginning. Yeah, and I was like, you know what? I don't care that uh, I can't take your ass. The discipline from a black mom and an Asian dad. Yeah, I know, I know. I it's... got my ass lit up. Yeah. And then my mom will be like, I don't care if you're an adult, you need, and I'll still get the belt. Yeah, and you don't want to post that on the internet. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth it for me. <laughs> but um, when I see my parents, like, it's funny, whenever, my, like recently, I, I saw my dad, who's like, I forgot what he was upset about. I think it was like a neighbor who made him want to move his car or something. And he stood his ground and, you know, they kind of got in each other's face. So he was like heated up and he was like, you know, getting all hyped up. And my mom, seeing my mom hype my dad up <laughs> was just such a beautiful thing. Like she was like, mm, that's right, John. Preach King. That's right. Oh, hell no. I don't want none of this Oda, that... this Oda, this Oda heat. And my yes. dad was just like, like, yeah, and he was trying to get in my face and blah, blah, you know, he was oh my God. going off and seeing her hype him up. Oh my God. I was like, hell yeah. Heck That's yeah. Like, about. this is such a good union. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if he would have got this, if it would, you know, would have been different or, mm -hmm. and even like me with my friends, like, I just see this, like, 
you know, this unity and it makes sense to me. I'm like, this, this is, you know, uh, once again, I'm like, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, there are so many similarities that like, yeah. since those aren't highlighted, and the animosity is highlighted that it just mm-hmm. becomes that's what we're known for with each other mm-hmm. is like hating each other and fighting each other and that's yeah. and it's also not even us that's perpetuating those ideas into our minds yeah mm-hmm. i'm like where us. did that even come from yes. oh wait it's mm-hmm. not the asian community or the black community doing mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. There's no one in this room on the zoom no one's in this room <laughs> on the zoom yeah. i'm not gonna say voldemort's name <laughs> <laughs> Well, last question here before we go into a quick fire round. What are some ways that you're both keeping or trying to keep your connections to both your Asian and Black cultural backgrounds strong? By wearing a shirt. Mm. Oh, I love them. By wearing shirts like these. Um, I'm joking, but not at the same time. But uh, (laughs) also Duolingo. Mm. (laughs) Just fucking taking a five minute session every day i'm like okay i did some yeah. tires today but my grandma and trying to spend as much time with my grandma too mm-hmm. um you know because because we're getting older and like i, I the more I, i'm just like damn mortality is a bitch ain't it like you know we gotta cherish these moments um and also ask questions right mm-hmm. i think about when my grandpa passed away i'm like damn like when an elder passes away there are stories and experiences that you will never ever Mm -hmm. receive yeah that's gone it's Mm -hmm. gone right so I made sure in college when I wrote one of my thesis papers I asked I I wrote it about my grandma's experience you know leaving or during the war being in in Taiwan and and the mainland during the war during the civil war and world war ii Mm -hmm. right so I have that Mm -hmm. somewhere Mm -hmm. on a hard drive (laughs) (laughs) I'll It'll find it and read it, it again. On a floppy day. disk. Yeah, yeah, on a floppy disk somewhere <laughs> covered in dust. But yeah, these are the ways, right? Ask the questions and you'll be surprised by the answers. Another thing about my grandma. Oh, that's what I wanted to say. Janine, you brought this up, like talking about sides of the family. Mm-hmm. I remember in your grandma, I remember thinking that my grandma didn't want to share me with the family that lived in Shanghai because I studied mm-hmm. out abroad out there. Mm-hmm. And I remember... Like, what? wait, hold on, why don't, I, why don't I get to meet them or talk? And I was afraid to even ask my grandma the question. I just didn't even ask her. I was like, oh, well, it's probably because, you know, mm-hmm. she's she's either racist or the family out here is racist. Um, and then I asked her and she's like, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't really fuck with them like that. Oh. She didn't say it like that. She's like, I don't really <laughs> fuck with them like that. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. <laughs> So All it's right. Not be- it's not because I'm black. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, now she she was telling me she's getting older, so I don't know if I'll ever get to do it. And that's the thing. It's like if I had asked that question earlier, it would have been so easy because mm. it would have been like, okay, you don't fuck with them, but do you fuck with other family members or like? And then she started telling me about her sisters and how she doesn't like necessarily talk to one of her brothers, but she talks to her sister. And then her sister has a daughter that has a son that's like around my age, and I'm like oh yeah, we should go there together, you know, and we could just, we could meet them. And I'm like, damn, if I had just asked this question earlier, Mm -hmm. we could have actually just done this way earlier. Yeah, I think a lot of times we carry this idea and we just believe in it. We Mm -hmm. just believe that it's racism or we believe whatever idea in our mind is. Mm -hmm. And we're like, well, I'm not even going to ask because I already know the answer. Mm -hmm. You don't know the answer unless you ask the question, right? So I think that's another thing moving forward is like having that courage and that bravery. And, and, and even in hindsight, it's like, wow, it's not even courage and bravery. It's just sort of deconditioning my mind into thinking that I know the answer when I don't. Mm-hmm. And, and and that will bring you so much astronomically closer to your culture and to the, and certain sides of the family and, and certain stories that you would not access otherwise. And it mm-hmm. starts with you just mm-hmm. asking the question. Simple. Mm-hmm. How about for you, Janine? Ways that you're trying to keep connection to both your Asian and Black cultures? Oh, definitely exactly what Ryan said. Listening, learning, asking the questions. I feel like, you know, forever being the student, you know, for for each culture. Like I had my first trip to Japan in 2019 and that Mm. was amazing. I mean, I felt like um, I got to go through with Taste Made and it was like through this contest and in front of like the crew, they'd be like setting up a shot. 
And I'm just like in tears, just looking around and being like, my people was here. And they're like, are you ready? We're going to go back to one. I'm like, (laughs) okay. (laughs) You know, and um, I definitely want to go back now that, you know, pandemonium's slowing down. Yeah. Just forever learning. And yeah. Asking the questions. I notice, you know, I wish I did ask my grandmother more questions, but I think at the time, you know, I I was kind of scared. Um, but I'm asking my aunts a lot more questions on my dad's side. My mom's side is just like full of knowledge about like our history and everything and our family history. And they constantly want me to watch anytime they come and visit. Uh, my mom's from Indiana. Anytime they come and visit, they always want to watch these documentaries. So we learn about black people, not only like in Africa, there are black people in Asia, there were black people, you know, they were all everywhere, North America already. They were in Hawaii and um, just going down through that. And I feel like that's how I stay, you know, connected with my culture, my identity is just, yeah, asking questions, learning, staying connected with family. And it's funny, I wanted to say when you were talking about your grandma and when she went back to Shanghai and it's crazy how in your mind, I think just through life and these experiences that you, you get kind of stuck on this. Oh, is it because I'm half black? Is it because I'm half Asian? Cause I felt like that for a while too. I even, I could see myself doing it when I started dating, when I was getting older throughout my twenties. I would ask guys I would date like, oh, do you care that I'm half Asian or do you care that I'm half black or you care I'm I'm half, I'm black and Asian or, you know, does it bother you? And of course, every guy I ever dated, not like it's a lie, but you know, (laughs) they're always just like, no, that's exactly why I'm dating. (laughs) Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But the fact that it was in my mind, like even my husband now, I remember when I asked him that and he, he remembers too. And he's like, yeah, I thought it was such a strange question. I remember thinking like, I mean, I'm not yeah. blind for one. Yeah. I can see you. And, you yes. know, I think that's beautiful about you. Do you care that I'm Romanian? I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just crazy how the mind, like we're fighting something, but then we become the problem. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you both for sharing ways, how you guys stay connected to your culture. I'm sure our listeners could really relate and we'll take that in, when they, when they're trying to stream their, their, um, cultural background as well. Mm-hmm. But right now it is time for fire slash random question round. Ooh. So ideally these answers are fairly, you know, quickly or are quick and short. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, I'll let's do it. Like I'll ask the question and then Janine will go first, first and then Ryan will go next. Okay. Okay. So first question is. What's your favorite Asian food or snack? Anything noodles or rice. Yeah. Is Asian food. Yeah. <laughs> My grandma's ginger crab. Boom. Ooh. Ooh. Mm. Shoes in the house. They what? used to be. No, they used to not be in the house. And then now I started to notice we all wear shoes in the house. Yeah. When did that change? I have to ask. Sorry. When did that change? Uh, I want to say around high school or college. I, I mean, my brother's going to get on me, but I feel like when the boys came into play, because they were a little bit more rowdy is when my parents couldn't keep up with the take your shoes off of the house inside the house. Um, but yeah, I want to say that around like high school is when it changed shoes in the house, unfortunately. When I hear shoes in the house, the first word that comes to my mind is blasphemy. <laughs> it's respect. Yes. So Ryan's a no. Yeah. <laughs> Strong um, no. Do, you, do you speak Japanese for Janina or do you speak Chinese for Ryan? No, I wish. I, I speak Chinese. And I'm not gonna lie, people think I'm like fluent, fluent, because they see my videos, start talking to me. Like, I don't know <laughs> what the like, hell you're saying, buddy. <laughs> I <laughs> thought you were fluent too. Same, five, actually, me too. Give me five minutes to process. <laughs> Duolingo. <laughs> yeah. It's just, well, I mean, like, I'm more fluent than I probably think I am. You know, mm-hmm. self, very self critical when it comes to language. But like, when they start speaking in paragraphs, without taking a breath and they're speaking fast. I'm just like, dude, come on, man. Don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. Mm, have you ever done any roles because you're an actor speaking Chinese? Yeah, I did. On the morning show, I they, I was speaking Chinese. I remember getting that audition and being like, who else is going to do this? They need a black dude who speaks Chinese and can do a British accent. So I was Yee. like, if I don't get this, if I don't get this, yeah, I'm not an actor. I should just quit. <laughs> yeah, You know? 
I'd love to also see, because like this is what happens in, in the acting world. I know these are supposed to be short answers, but I just have an anecdote. In the acting world, people always lie about their skills. Mm. And so I would love to see the other auditions of people pretending <laughs> that they spoke Chinese. Probably, oh, I would probably my throw gosh. Up. I would throw up listening to that. Oof. Anyway. Um, okay. And then this is the last one. You have to ask this because we talk about this often on this podcast. Dating history. Any preferences? Well, I'm married to a Romanian guy. Um, but I want to say I had the most fun dating Latin guys. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. yeah. There was no like, you know what I think it was? I think it was in my mind. The pressure. I never dated mm -hmm. an Asian, so I wouldn't know actually. I tried. I tried. I, feel like, I, feel like I tried. I feel like that's culture and not race, because race isn't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, it's like a cultural thing. For me, I don't really, I mean, I use I used to. Mm -hmm. And then I started dating, like, you know every race and every ethnicity and I started realizing like damn there's like so many things I don't know and there's so many mm -hmm. similarities that I didn't think existed and mm -hmm. there's so many like um ways of connecting that I didn't understand and 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 then I I also started to see like why people would want to marry someone that's just like them mm -hmm. but then also why people marry people that aren't like mm -hmm. them and I'm like oh like then I can just date anybody and I could have that same connection. It's really about the person, mm -hmm. not necessarily about the race or the culture. Mm -hmm. Like in my mind, ideally I'd like, well, I don't want the Chinese to die. So I'd want to make, you know, you know, I'd want the, the someone who's Chinese or speaks Chinese, but the older I get, I'm just like, I'll do it. I, if I'm that serious about it, not the Chinese culture, not dying, then I will mm. it'll be on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. Why should I like marry somebody else for something that's important to me? Have you ever dated a Blasian? <laughs> if I have to think that hard, then I probably haven't. <laughs> I thought the video was like frozen for a second. I was like, <laughs> if I had to think that hard, then I probably haven't. Same. Well, I, I okay, I have, but it, not seriously. But oh. what happened in my mind was like, oh, this person, this this woman, should know exactly how I feel. And like we should have this like mm. electric connection and they should be able to tele tele yeah. telepathically yeah. understand me but it's like no it, you put so many expectations on yeah. on the culture and the mm. mix that it's like no this person's a human like oh i'm more asian than you oh i'm more black like the, all these sort of all the conditioning started to show and i had to like mm. really pause and be like you need to treat this woman as a human and not like mm. yeah because now i'm becoming my own worst enemy Mm -hmm. you know? having therapy sessions with her telling her about your experience yeah yeah <laughs> wait have like... you before janine dated Blasian? no and it's funny no i i think i was always well the two other Blasian guys i knew in my high school that everybody loved i mean i swear i don't know if this was how it was for you ryan maybe not but first off i didn't even know they were Blasian until mm -hmm. later um because yeah i just i had no idea i honestly thought they were like latin or hispanic or something um and then they were like super cool like i was like dorky and weird and they both like i said ball is life they were all varsity basketball they were tall and i was just like hi but like i said i didn't, I didn't even know they were blasian until after high school i dated a hoppa guy but not not blasian i i would you say you that you were a dork like outwardly i think you know a lot of i was a jock in high school see I, they always but, the cool one but they but everyone's like you're so cool but in my mind i'm like i'm a dork and i like anime and i like but i can't show that shit to nobody because yeah i think mm. i'm a cool job now you know? it's cool now yeah now i'm like okay i was a nerd the whole time a lot of these a lot of my athlete friends were also nerds and we didn't know because we didn't talk about Secret that nerd. but yeah <laughs> yeah i love nerds well thank you so much for sharing your dating preferences <laughs> to close off this episode what is something you both are looking forward to this year? I will say getting healthier. I'm trying to work on my body right now, my health and getting older. I feel like that's something I'm always scared of, but I'll say getting older. I'm excited about that. Getting, being present in these moments where mm -hmm. like there are times where I, I feel, you know, that like I'm lost and I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know the direction that I'm heading. Right. But just realizing that, like, that's just a state of mind. 
Mm. that I can be present in that. And there are also equally moments where I feel so high, I'm on top of the world, right? And that's just a moment in time. And that that moment is the same as this moment as the same as this moment. And so to accept that those are all things that I can feel and that's okay, and not to let it stop me in my tracks and feel like I'm not where I need to be, right? Because it's all sort of relative. And I think the thing that that I'm really looking forward to is like really having gratitude for all the things that I have and that mm. I've built and just living in that for as long as I can and reminding myself in those dark times that I have. But honestly, when I'm out of them, I'm like, that wasn't even a dark time, dude. That only existed in your mind. Yeah. Mm. Like to understand that the humor in that, first of all, but also like the gratitude for like my parents and my grandparents and Asian boss girl and wanting me to be here and talking to Janine and, and and being able to have these connections in this community like that I didn't have before, mm -hmm. right? So just continuing to move for, forward in that sort of joy and love and just and allowing myself to be free and float in, in that and that's fine and opportunities will come or they won't and it'll be, it'll be all love and, and, and and no matter if the direction feels like this or backwards or forwards or down or up, it's like you're in the right place that you need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Accepting that that is, that is part of life. Yeah. 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 I love that. Both very powerful answers. How can our listeners connect with you both? Um, at Janine K Oda on all my socials. I'm trying to get better at YouTube. So hit me up on YouTube. <laughs> We'll make some content <laughs> together, Janine. Yes, I can't Ooh. wait. Let's do it. Ooh. Also, also, if y'all want to make some content, we could do that too. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Uh, uh, <laughs> people can find me at, at Ryan Alex H, R Y A N A L E X H on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Um, and don't be afraid to DM me. Mm. Maybe I, you know, I like it at least. <laughs> I know. I was like, I don't want to say that because I take forever to get back to people. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I'll see it. I'll see it. I'll say this. Theme. I'll see it. Left so, on red. Dang. Okay. Say something. Say something. It'll be seen. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you both so much for joining us and sharing your stories with us and our listeners. We are so thankful. Thank you. Really great. Thank this you. was such an it honor. Was it was dope. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Since they share their socials, we'll share ours. We're at Asian Boss Girl. You can find us on all the socials and share and tag us if you resonate with this episode. Comment on this Instagram post. You really want to engage with you in the comments. I'm pretty sure Janine and Ryan will be there too. And um, also you could catch us on all the podcasting platforms. Make sure to leave us a rating and review. It really helps us out. And with that, we'll catch you on the next episode. Bye. 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 Bye.